Good evening, everyone. So we're, uh, we're at the last, last talk of the day. I hope everyone's had a, a, a brilliant day so far. Um, so I'm sure you're all, all way more excited about the after party than listening to me speak, so we'll get on with it. So scaling is one of those things that we, we can be quite guilty of ignoring early on. Um, often, you know, we'll build this application, and there might be pff, 10 users, and we're like, yeah, it's great, it works. And then things happen, it gets more popular, and it starts to slow down, and you start getting these weird little behaviors, and then you go, yeah, perhaps I should have done something about it. There's a lot of different ways we can scale. Uh, this talk is very much kind of a, a high-level overview of some of the different approaches we can take. And not just looking at things you can do with new applications, because that's great, but let's be honest, who's doing it at the start? We've probably all got applications in the wild already. So we're looking at how we can apply them to existing applications. Now, just quickly, who was in my previous talk a couple of hours ago? Not too many, good. So I'm going to say the same thing again. You can all tweet about how I need to come up with some new material. Before I go any further, um, as I've, I mentioned in my previous talk, this is my, my first time to Poland in general. Um, it's beautiful. And this is also obviously the first time I've spoken at, the, at a, a conference in Poland, because it's the first time I've been here. Um, and you know, the organizers, I think, have done, uh, done a fantastic job. I've had a great time. It's a stunning venue. Let's be honest, you, know, you look out over the mountains, and you're like, you know what, as, as, as conference settings go, yeah, this, this is all right. It's OK. So please, if you get an opportunity, speak to any of the organizers, any of the volunteers, and just thank them, because they've all done, from the AV guys to the organizers to everything else, they've done a great job in making sure that this conference runs as, as well as it has done so far, and as well as I know tomorrow will do. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, who am I? Uh, my name is Liam Wiltshire. These slides are now updated. I am the CTO. Anyone in my previous talk, I hadn't updated my job title. It's, it's a bit of a fake title because there are three developers, so it doesn't really count, but it's fine. Uh, I'm the CTO at a company called Tebex. Now, you've probably never heard of us. Uh, we're a small company based in Nottingham in the UK. And what we do is we provide uh, monetization solutions for people that run uh, game servers. So particularly games like Minecraft and, and Ark and things like that, we provide them a way of generating revenue from their, from their servers and, and from the players that play on their servers. Um, so the reason I mention that is that a lot of this talk is about what we've done at Tebex, but also how you can apply that to other, other projects. Uh, scaling is a big topic. You know, there's hundreds of books, thousands of articles, blog posts, whatever. As I've already mentioned, this is very much an introduction, some kind of high-level ideas that you can take away and, and do a bit more digging into. We're going to take a look at some scaling strategies. We're going to look at the reasons why you'll need to scale or the kind of things that will tell you you need to scale. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these things are things that we've either done or attempted and went badly on our own platform, um, or things that actually we're building into a, a new product that we're currently working on. As I've mentioned, a lot of these ideas have come out of, of what Tebex is doing. So very briefly, um, just kind of give you an idea of our architecture and, and how this all fits together. Um, so, so far, so very little, little splodge there. That represents our admin panel. It's very basic. We mainly use Laravel. Uh, we use some other bits and pieces. We've got a little bit of ZF in there. We've got some slightly older legacy code on CodeIgniter <coughs> in there. But mainly Laravel, uh, admin panel, really basic, not very interesting. We've then got our customer control panel. This gets quite a bit of use, obviously, because all the customers are maintaining their product listings, their site design, uh, transaction history, all that stuff is in their control panel. But again, yes, it pulls out quite a lot of data, but it's still just a control panel. But then it gets interesting. So all of our customers have one or more web stores. So to sell, to, to sell the things that you're monetizing, you have to have a web store. These are unique to every customer. So they've obviously all got their own products. They've got their own designs and so on. Um, around, at the moment, we have about 670,000 uh, web stores on the platform. Every web store then has to link to one or more servers, because that's what we do. We're in the gaming industry. If you had a web store without a server, it'd be a bit pointless. So we then have, obviously, communicate with the servers to say when purchases have happened, show what the product listings are, things like that. Um, 
pushing you know, updates to the servers, that sort of thing. And so we have about 700,000 uh, servers on our, our platform just over. So, OK, that's all fine. And I get to use some pretty icons. But what does this actually mean? You know, when we're talking working at scale, uh, what do we mean? Now, we're not the, the biggest. You know, we're not Facebook levels or anything even remotely close to that. But on an average day, uh, we do about half a million to 600,000 requests an hour. So that's not bad, right? Um, we do get regular spikes. And when I mean regular, you know, kind of it's every weekend plus Sundays during the week, you will see over a period of a couple of hours, it might go up to three or four times that. Um, now, that could be because of something like Black Friday. Black Friday is a major date for us. Um, when one of our enterprise customers who have you know, hundreds of thousands of players release a sale for their new rank and they don't tell us, thanks a lot. Um, that's always good fun. Um, and then another one that's a bit weird, Christmas Day. And I, I suppose you know, people get games for Christmas or money or whatever. Um, you know, Christmas Day is not a day that I would think is a, is a major selling day. But actually, at one point uh, last year, we did one, nearly one and a half million requests in an hour. So what do I know? Then on top of this, we have people all the time trying to take the platform down because it's gaming and that's what happens. And that might be, you know, we call it a DOS attack. It's not really because it doesn't actually deny service, but they're trying. Um, and that might be you know, 100,000 requests uh, a, a minute just as a normal thing. And then we'll see spikes of up to about a million requests an hour or so now and again. But that's all good. So I'm going to be completely honest now. If I didn't have to scale my application, I wouldn't bother because it's hard <laughs> and I'm quite lazy. Um, the reason why any of us have to scale, if you've got an application that you're having to scale because it's getting too much traffic, then congratulations, you have built a successful application. Congratulations to you. And that's the point. We are doing this because you know, you're, you're getting to a point where there's too much traffic, too much data. Whatever it is, you know, the servers are under too much load, and we are talking about a capacity problem. You've got X amount of capacity in, in some metric, be that RAM or disk or throughput, whatever it is, and you've got more people requesting that capacity than you have available. That's, that's the definition of needing to scale, right? So how do we know that we need to scale? Normally, the problems you'll have will kind of happen in three phases. So what you'll first of all notice is that performance is perhaps slowing down. Perhaps pages that, you know, someone goes into their control panel and a, a, a month ago it was loading in 50 milliseconds and now it's loading in 200 milliseconds. And you go, yeah, see, we're seeing this trend and it's, it's trending the wrong way. We don't like that. So that's often what happens first. You know, what's likely happening is requests are having to wait for resources. Um, they're getting them eventually, but obviously that small delay is just slowing everything down. You'll then start getting intermittent outages. So most requests are still being fulfilled. People are, are requesting you know, to access that page or submit this data or access this API, whatever it is. Most of them are working, but a small percentage are starting to get you know, errors and you'll see in your logs like out of memory errors and that sort of thing. I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a hint. If you've not scaled by that point, then you're in trouble. Because the next step is unavailability. You just flat run out. You run out of RAM. Stuff gets moved into swap. If anyone's experienced this, trying to use memory that's actually a hard disk is a terrible idea. Whoever invented that needs to be shot. Um, and everything just goes blah. Uh, at which point, you really, really need to scale. But hopefully, what will happen is you'll be able to start measuring some of these things. Like I said, your error logs, you're using something like New Relic or Datadog or something to see your response times. And when you start seeing these trending patterns, you go, right, you deal with it at that point, rather than you know, the, the slow performance and outage point, rather than the unavailability point. That said, <laughs> we often do leave it perhaps a little bit too late. I have done. I, I've certainly left it a little bit too late. So what are the things that we can do quickly? What are the, the first steps that we can take to immediately go, right, let's, let's give ourselves some breathing room right now? First thing to think about is the separation of concerns. Now, we often think about this as developers. You know, we'll have our presentation layer, and we'll have our business logic, and our, our, our data access, whatever else. Now, that can apply to your infrastructure as well. Um, who, at some point, maybe not now, has built an application, 
When, and when they first started, they had one box, and their DB was on it, and Redis was on it, and their web server was on it, all on one box. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everyone, right? <laughs> twice. Someone's done it twice. It's all good. <laughs> so, and, and that's normal, because ultimately, when you're, if you're building a proof of concept, and, and again, let's be honest, most proof of concepts become the version one of production. That's how this works. Um, and then we rewrite it afterwards, and it's fine. Um, but yeah, when you've got a proof of concept, why pay for three boxes to do these three different things, or, or spend however long setting up Kubernetes or whatever? It's like, no, we'll stick on a box. It's fine. <laughs> Um, so the first thing you can do is actually split that up. Now, that's, that's one part of it, but also it can be within that. So it's not just about putting the DB on a separate server and putting your web instance on a separate server. You can then split up the work within that. Um, slightly embarrassing story. Before I worked at Tebex, I worked for a digital agency who uh, mainly did Magento. Sorry. And we had this we had this one client, and they were they'd started out as a a, a brick and mortar store F physical they had a, like eight physical stores, and then they wanted this website so that basically all the stuff they sold in their stores they could also sell online fair enough now because they started out as a physical store, they had this really old point of sale system, so all their their cash registers and their stock management and stuff was this old ibm based system with like fixed fixed length columns of all their data tables, and it was horrendous. <laughs> anyway, needless to say, they weren't willing to stop using this system, so we then had to take all this data and import it in. Seems straightforward enough, except all the data was in XML. Blah. Second of all, the way the, the data was structured was that Everything, everything was a code. It was kind of normalized to a ridiculous degree. So, for example, um, they had some, some, they were selling some T-shirts that had washing instructions, like wash at 30 degrees or only dry clean or whatever that might be. Now, the odds of actually that data being replicated multiple times is fairly small, and yet they had a separate washing instructions table <laughs> with all these instructions in, and then a look, and then a reference, an ID, washing instruction ID in the actual product table to say, use that washing instruction, despite the fact I think there was probably only half a, or six or seven or so that were used more than once anyway. But it's fine, and they did this for everything. So they did this for that, they did it for colors, for sizes, they did it for um, anything you could possibly imagine, lengths. So you could buy something as five meters or 10 meters, for example, they wouldn't put five, meters and 10 meters in, they would have a, a length lookup table. And then that was, and so anyway, point being, it was a lot of data processing. And we'd noticed that their website, every two hours or so, would just stop working. Bear in mind it's every two hours, and given what I've just said, I'm sure you can imagine why. So we would pull the, down the latest XML files. Now, the great thing about these XML files is they didn't just tell you changes. No, 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 they gave you the entire data set every time. Every two hours, we got the entire data set. And we processed this data set, and it consumed 16 gig of RAM, and everything died. <laughs> so obviously, we needed to make it more efficient, of, of course, but that was going to take time. So actually, the, 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 the quick way of fixing that is temporarily, we got a, uh, I think it was a Linode server at the time. You could use a DigitalOcean droplet or whatever for 20 bucks a month or summer. And it just sat there and every two hours processed the data and then put it back into the database. Now, the production server stayed up. The client was happy. We bought ourselves the time to go and fix it properly. So it's not just about you know, a database and a web server. You, know, you don't have to go as far as microservices. You can do. But if you've already got a monolith, just break it up into three parts that then maybe have some API communication between them when it's necessary can give you that extra capacity until you can kind of get to a point where you can do things uh, properly. I'm going to talk about optimization. Now, yes, optimization isn't technically scaling. Um, so I have this argument every time I do this talk, but I know it's not scaling. But it, it, it achieves the same thing. Uh, right now, what we're doing at this moment in time is buying ourselves more time going, we know we need to scale, but we need time to architect that. So what can we do to give us a month or two months to get all that stuff done properly? And optimizing is, is a perfectly legitimate thing. Ultimately, the reason you need to scale is because you've run out of resources. Well, if you can make your application do more with the resources it already has, then you can give, like I said, buy yourselves that time. 
Um, logging is a big part of this. So like, like I've mentioned before, install something like New Relic. Um, that's what we use. But Datadog is also very good. They now have uh, a, a, a company-published PHP library, which they didn't have previously. You used to have to use a third-party one. But now they've got their own, um, which is really good. And that will give you, you know, and things like Solid Query Log, and that will give you your bottlenecks. That will show you where you're losing time, where resources are being consumed. Also consider why it's taking the most resource. Um, a good example is you might have a, a SQL query that takes 40 seconds to run. Now, immediately, you're going to go, holy shit, that's not good. I need to fix that. But actually, if it's a query that runs once a day to build a report, does it really matter? Not really. Unless it's at your busiest time of day, then it may be, but then just move when you generate the report. You know, if it's running once a day, who cares? On the other hand, if you've got some query that's locking up a database connection for only 150 milliseconds, doesn't sound like a long time, but if that's running 10 times a second, all of a sudden you're tying up all your connections. <laughs> and that's the things you need to be looking at. Okay. A common part of this is the M plus one issue. Now, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know what the M plus one issue is. Uh, some nodding heads, that's good. But it's something that happens in, in most ORMs. I can't say all because I don't know every ORM in existence, but I imagine it's near enough all of them. Um, and the reason it happens is that within ORMs, we have relationships. That's kind of part of what an ORM does. Now, relationships in most ORMs are what we call lazy loaded by default. So that means if I've got a book and it's got a relationship of an author, it will only load that relationship if I ask for it. If I go, right, I've got this book, now I need to know the author's name, it will then go, right, okay, I've got a relationship for that, run a query, pull back the author, happy days. Which makes sense to start off with because it's less data in your original query, you're just getting the book, you might not need that author. So we'll, we'll leave that, we'll defer it until we need it. The problem is when we start using it in a loop. Now, here's an example that is, it's in Eloquent, um, some, I have no problem with that. With I have no problem with that active record. I'm going to say that it's fine. Uh, but anyway, here's, here's an example. So we're going to grab some users from a company, and we're assuming this is an ID of five. So it's going to get a list of the users that belong to to a particular company. We're now going to loop through these loop users, uh, and we'll imagine this is in a, a view somewhere or whatever. And we want to get the department name for each user. So that's now going right for the user. Load the department relation relationship, and then grab the name. So can we see the problem here? Let's assume this user, this query here, this select here has returned 100 rows. Now, for every single one of those rows, it's going to do another query to grab the department. So all of a sudden, we've now done 101 queries, and all we've done is grab a load of users and print out what department they're in. That's not great. It gets worse. So now let's imagine that each department has a supervisor. OK, so we're now grabbing our, our, our users. Um, this time, let's say it's 1,000 users. Now, uh, we're now going to grab everyone's department and echo out the name. So we've now done the original query plus 1,000 queries for the user loop. Oh, and then we're going to get the supervisor name. So that now says, you know, we'll take that department relation that we've just loaded, load another relation to get the supervisor and get their name. So we've now done 2,001 queries just to print out a list of departments and supervisors. It's not great. <laughs> So uh, yeah, now the way to solve this is to eager load your relationships. Now what that means is when you pull in your original query, so when you do your, your user query here, for example, say, right, can you also grab me while you're at it the department relationship and the department supervisor relationship? And then what it will do is it'll go, right, I'll grab all the users. Oh, and now I have all the IDs for all the users. I can do one query and pull out the, the required departments and then and hydrate those back into the users, I can then get all the supervisors and hydrate those onto those relationships. And now your 2001 queries has become three queries. Happy days. Now, the only slight problem with that, uh, and this is a bit of a self-plug, uh, is that by default, you know, those, those, relation, those relationships that you need might change. In, in Tebex's example, 
um, we allow store owners to build their own templates. On certain plans, you can build your own templates for your store to make them look how you want. Now, that may mean that actually the relationships change because they request a relationship that we've not thought about, and now it's going to go and load that relationship that's not eager loaded, and we're back to square one. So, I didn't really know what the solution for this was. Uh, and I went to a, a conference a few years ago now. Um, it was a, a polyglot conference, so it was covering lots of different languages. And basically, because nothing better was on, I went to a, a Ruby talk. I know, Ruby talk, who knew? Um, and actually, <laughs> they were talking about th this exact problem, the M plus one issue. And what they'd done at their uh, company is they'd come up with a solution where if you had a collection, and an item within that collection requests a relationship that's not already been loaded, it actually went back and loaded it on the entire collection instead. So again, you, you're going back to that, it's kind of deferring the eager load, but it's still doing it as one query instead of a thousand queries. And I went, you know what? That's a really good idea. I'm going to steal it. Um, and we have the Laravel JIT loader. Obviously, it's for Laravel. There are actually now some similar implementations for some other RRMs. I was reading a blog post Li literally a week ago or so, where someone's done something very similar for um, some of the RM, the same one, the frameworks, whatever. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, but there are there are other implementations coming coming about, um, and you know it it doesn't do anything particularly fantastic. All it does is it keeps a track of what collection the model belongs to, and then it goes right. Well, actually, if I'm in a collection and I haven't got this relationship, then load it. And it just does it on the fly. So we now have eager loading on demand when we need it without having to worry about us getting it right or putting in ones we don't need or missing out ones that we do need. So that worked quite well. Um, Doctrine has got one now, I think, and, and I think other people are working on other implementations, like I said. So all good. So hopefully you've got to this point. You've bought yourself some time. You've perhaps got rid of some M plus one issues, which has freed up some database resources. You've Re realize that your cron job is running like a dog, so you've moved that onto a separate um, server, whatever else, and you've now gone, right, we've got a couple of weeks now to actually get this sorted properly. So th the first thing we're going to look at is hardware scaling, um, obviously, or, you know, in terms of scaling. Now, hardware scaling <laughs> essentially means more hardware in, in some way, right? Um, apparently, you can use it to beat a self-DDoS with Ajax. Um, Anyone who's in my previous talk will know I, I quite like these commit strip comics. Do check them out. They're, you look at them, and as much as a lot of it is putting your head in your hands going, we don't admit to this, but yeah, that's literally my life. Um, so it's so all good. So one of the things that's important is to know what you're scaling. Um, for example, if, if, you're, you know, if your DB server is struggling, but you scale your web instances, you're not going to get anywhere, right? As a general rule, the DB tends to start struggling before your web nodes do. That's not always, and you need to check your own metrics, but often that's the case. Um, so, you know, that's fine. Let's assume for now that we're going to scale our web instances because DBs are hard. Um, so the first port of call when scaling is normally vertical scaling. Vertical scaling quite simply means a bigger box. So you've got a box with 32 gig of RAM and you know, a quad-core CPU, you now get a box with 64 gig of RAM and uh, two quad-core CPUs or a not-core CPU. Now, that's fine. It's easy. You want to scale up, you get this bigger pro box provisioned, you go, right, redeploy, done. Simple. It's easy. Uh, there's a lot less moving parts. The problem with vertical scaling, of course, is that it's very much a one-way transaction. You can't really scale back down. If you have, like, peaks, you can't really add more resources when you need it and then drop back to a smaller box. I mean, you could, like you could, but it doesn't really work. So it's fine if it's a one-time thing, but you still don't have any redundancy. If that box goes down, you're still screwed. So yeah, it's not, it's not great. So obviously, the opposite of vertical scaling is horizontal scaling. Now this means, instead of having one box of that size, you have lots of boxes. And then you spread your load across all these different boxes. Um, when I say a box, obviously, it probably these days isn't a physical box. It's probably a, a virtual box, a, a virtualized uh, server, a cloud server of some description. But you have multiple instances, and, and you spread that load. Um, 
So you might have multiple clusters. You might have a cluster of web nodes. You might have a cluster of DB nodes, Redis nodes, whatever else that might be. It is more complicated to set up because now you've got lots of moving parts and you've got to think about data consistency and, and things like that. Um, but it's fault. Um, it, it kind of is, is has redundancy built in. So if, if one of your web nodes fails, but you've still got two others, then yes, they'll probably slow down a bit, but they'll carry on chugging along until you can spin another node back up. So you've got that kind of redundancy built in, um, and you can obviously add more and take them away as need dictates. So that's kind of largely what um, you know, one looks like. At the top, you've got these load balances. Again, for redundancy, we have two. Um, and then they, they tell the traffic where to go. So they'll go, the first request that comes in might go to box A, then the next one will come in might go to box B, and box C, and box D, and so on. Um, or they might go to the one with the least load. There's a couple of different ways it can work. As I mentioned, there are some challenges with uh, horizontal scaling. Now, the first thing is the file system. Obviously, when you've got one box, you have one file system. Now you've got multiple, box, uh, multiple servers, you've got multiple file systems. So sessions, if you're still storing those on disk, that becomes a problem because user, a user's first request goes to server A, a session gets spun up, gets written, a file gets written. They then make another request, and they get redirected to server C, and all of a sudden their sessions disappeared. So a couple of fairly, fairly straightforward ways around that. Use a database to store your sessions, or use Redis, which works quite nicely. Um, likewise with uploading files. Now, if you were previously uploading avatars, for example, and just sticking them on disk and then serving them when required, all of a sudden, someone goes to a different server, they're not going to have those. Th those files won't be there. So again, using something like S3, um, you know, Fly System for Laravel makes this very, uh, sorry, by League makes this very simple. Um, Laravel's done a wrapper around it, I'm not really sure why, but there we are. And it, but it's quite easy, you can put them in S3 and now they're available anywhere. Often you'll find that horizontal scaling does work really well. Um, there are some things you have to consider. Um, so if you're adding or removing servers kind of whenever, things like IP addresses will change. Now, we found this to be a problem because we push out commands to these servers, and they are told to trust a certain set of IP addresses. Well, if you've only got four IP addresses in your pool that they're trusting, you've got eight servers, half those servers have an untrusted IP. So that then causes problems. And you have to then, if, if you're doing that sort of thing and whitelisting IPs or things like that, you do have to consider either having some form of NAT gateway that the outbound requests go through or you know, some, some solution so that you've still got known IPs kind of outbound. Um, so that's fine. But on the whole, scaling web instances isn't particularly tricky. You have to think about these things and make sure you've got the answers up front because doing it and then trying to solve these problems like we did is a nightmare. But it's not too bad. Databases, yeah, a little bit of a different beast. Um, there's a blog post that, that I read that filled me with confidence. The all you need is the title. Relational databases are not designed to scale. <laughs> it's like, OK, good. Well, we still need to scale it, but all right, whatever. Um, there are a few ways that we can go about it. Um, normally, we're talking about either sharding or replication. Both of them are valid, and we'll talk about both. But both of them also have their drawbacks. So sharding is something that you often hear about like being spoken about if you're looking at big companies. Someone like Google or Facebook, they all do their sharding because they've got lots and lots of very clever people that know all the answers. It is difficult to get right, though. Um, you have to come up, Sharding effectively is taking slices of your data and putting them in different instances. So you have to come up with a way of doing that. So you, it might be that you do it based on, I don't know, the, the last number of the ID. So if it's one, it goes in database instance one. If it's two, if it ends in a two, it goes in database instance two, three, so on. Or you could do it by time range. So 2018 records go in one database instance, 2019 records go in the next instance, and so on. However you do it, your application then needs to know which shard it's talking to. Um, and if you get it wrong, it becomes a real pain. So for example, let's, let's say you've got, you allow users to sign up. It's a fairly normal thing, right? And they have to provide a unique email address. So they type in their email address. You've sharded across 10 separate DB instances. 
you now, if you've not designed it properly, you now have to query every single database to know, has this email address already been registered? And all of a sudden, all your sharding has gone completely to pot, and you've got to start again. Obviously, there are ways around this. You either have a separate just lookup table just for emails that does nothing else or you know, whatever, but it's one of those things that actually getting sharding right can be, can be very tricky, which is a very good reason why we didn't do it. Um, so, like I said, you know, there is a, a kind of semi-sharding. There's this thing called partitioning. Now, it has some of the same benefits. The key difference is that while there are multiple copies of your table, each with a slice of the data, they exist within a single database instance. So you might have users 1 to 100, users 101 to 200, users 201 to 300, and, and so on. And they are separate logical tables, but they exist within the same database. Um, now, like I said, the benefit of this is that MySQL will do a lot of the work for you. So you just tell it, I want 10 partitions, and this is how I want you to split the data up. And it worries about it for you. When you do a query, it will then work out. Oh, well, I need this partition, or I need these two partitions, or however that is. It does a lot of that stuff for you. You don't get all the same benefits because you are, as I said, still using a single physical database instance. Um, but you can do some magic about putting different shards on diff uh, different partitions, sorry, on different disks. So if, if you're hitting disk limits, you can kind of partition and say, right, well, this partition is on, on one physical volume, this one's on a separate physical volume, so you've basically got double the disk throughput. So we can let you do some clever things like that. Obviously, the indexes are smaller because each table has its own index, so there are definitely some of the same benefits, and it does a lot of the work for you. But it's certainly not a silver bullet. Like I said, it's pretty simple to straight set up. You go, right, my users table, we're going to turn it into a hash of the ID, and I want six partitions. And it'll work it all out for you. It'll go, right, I'm going to, this is how I'm going to split it up. Uh, and then when you do an insert, it'll work out which partition it needs to go into. And when you do a select, it'll work out which partitions it needs, or indeed if it needs all the partitions. Um, so like I said, you know, it's not as bad as sharding if it has to do all the partitions, because it's still a single database instance. But equally, you don't have that infinite scale that you would do with sharding either. So it's kind of a, a middle ground. So sharding and partitioning all sound awfully complicated, right? So the thing that, that you're more likely to look at, certainly as a, a first um, kind of step, is replication. Now, unlike sharding, where you have a slice of the data on every database instance, with replication, the entire database exists in every instance. Now, you, whether that's two instances or 20 instances, the entire database is on every single one. And then literally, when you do a query, it's, or when you do a, you know, a write, it's copied across all the different instances, um, mostly. <laughs> it doesn't always work. Um, you have instances where if there's a lag in your replication, you've written to the one, and then you try and pull it out of another one, it doesn't exist yet, and you have to kind of handle that sort of case. But yeah, as a general rule, they, they, they may remain pretty much in sync. Uh, generally, when we're talking about DB, DB replication, we're talking about master-slave. Now, what that means is you have one server that is the master. Uh, we're not talking Doctor Who master here. Um, we're talking one, one server, and all the writes go to that individual server. Okay? So whenever you're doing a write query, it goes to this, this server that is the source of truth. And then that server is responsible for pushing it out to all the slaves. And then when you do your reads, when you do your selects, they then come from the slaves. Uh, replication normally happens fairly quickly. You know, we're talking 100 milliseconds or so, or so. Sometimes the slaves can fall behind, uh, but it's not normally so bad. Um, again, like with horizontal scaling of, servers, of web servers, it gives you that additional um, kind of resilience. If one of the slaves fails, you've still got other servers to pick up the slack. And if the master fails, you can always promote one of the slaves to be the new master and become the new source of truth, and you have that kind of resilience. So that's quite nice. Now. In theory, they give you an infinite ability to scale, but they only give you the ability to scale your reads. You've still got a single server that's accepting writes. So if you've got a write-heavy application, you're still going to end up being stung because your write server's now dead. Um, again, they're fairly easy to set up. Uh, most configs have a way of defining pools. So you have a, a pool of read connections and uh, a pool of write connections, and yeah, that's about it. As I mentioned, if you're scaling, if you've got a write-heavy a write application, you're likely to still hit a problem where you can't write fast enough. And then that's where you look at master-master replication. 
Um, there are a few different ways you can do this. Uh, at Tebex, we experimented with a thing called Galera Cluster. What it offers is near synchronous replication. Now, if anyone can tell me what near synchronous means, that would be fantastic, because I haven't got a clue. But apparently, you write, and although it is technically asynchronous where it pushes out to the other masters, you're not supposed to notice. And it's supposed to be ACID compliant, so all the transactions close, and that's all fine. Um, and so that's what we did. We had three DB nodes. Uh, we used Galera cluster to maintain so we could write to any of those nodes, and they would all cross sync. At least they were supposed to. So we, we had the bright idea a few years ago. We did this in November. Now, as I've already mentioned, Black Friday is quite a busy day for us. Kind of the whole Christmas period is a bit of a busy day for us. So why, why, why we chose to do this? Eh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It didn't go very well. Um, it was quite possibly my worst Christmas ever. <laughs> so we don't do that anymore. Um, so what else can we do? What, what's another way of doing it? And, and oftentimes, a simpler solution that is easier to maintain, as long as it achieves your goals, is way better than some really complex outlandish solution. And actually, another way of doing master-master replication is just having responsibility for certain tables on certain instances. So let's say you've got an e-commerce type platform. You might go, right, all our cat catalog -y type tables, our you know, products, our categories, that sort of stuff, are the, res the master responsibility lies with server A, and then all our kind of money and invoicey stuff, um, the responsibility lies with server B. Um, now that works. You have to be a little bit careful about how you do this, because otherwise, if you don't kind of segment them properly, you end up needing two right connections for both servers on each request anyway. Um, but that's certainly a way of doing it. Again, though, only do it if you need to. In actual fact, we moved everything to Aurora, which is an, an RDS thing or um, an RDS thing for Amazon. And the point of Aurora is it's a drop-in replacement for MySQL, but it has a fantastic write throughput to the point where actually we've not needed to scale our writes. We, we still have to scale our reads, and we've got, I think, three read uh, database reading slaves, but we now have gone back to one master, and actually the write throughput saves us having to juggle all this stuff anyway. So don't go more complex than you need to, I guess. So, caching. We're all dealing with dynamic content, right? We're probably pulling stuff from a database, or we're pulling stuff from third-party APIs, or whatever else. Well, that's bad. Dynamic content is bad. We're all bad people. If we just had flat HTML files, life would be so much easier. Well, that's a lie. But it'd be much quicker. You know, you'd go, hey, Nginx, just store, serve all these HTML files. Done. See you later. Obviously, that's not practical. Uh, but Anything that requires work is likely to be slow. Now, whether that's third-party API calls, whether that's database queries, or even long database data processing, if you've got something that has to churn through an array with 10,000 know, 10, uh, parts, and you know, you've got to do that before you can output anything to the page, it's going to be slow. So something we can do there, we can't obviously turn those in, you can't make that static because it's com coming from a database. But what we can do is we can use a memory cache to basically save those results so we don't have to do that work every single time. So a question I often get asked is, so, so what, what should we cache? All the things, cache everything. I mean, OK, maybe not everything. If you've got something that only gets loaded once every 24 hours, then your cache is going to be invalid before it comes around again. So don't bother with that. But if you've got something that, even if it gets loaded three times a minute, if you've got 50 things that all get loaded three times a minute, and you know that they stay consistent for that minute so you can cache them the first time, you've saved 150 DB requests, potentially. That's, that's worth having. So yeah, cache as much as you can, as much as makes sense. The way we do it is we use Redis. Um, so we have a shared Redis instance that all the web instances can talk to and stick things in cache, then check if the cache exists. And if not, then do the, the long, slow calculation. Uh, and that, that works very well. Related to what you should cache is often how long for. Now, it's a di it is a difficult question. Something that, you know, it, it's very difficult to come up with a, def a definitive answer for how long should I cache for. However, what I found works quite well, and people disagree with me on this because people quote the old saying about one of the difficult things, the two difficult things in web development is naming things and caching validation. 
That's bull. It's easy. <laughs> um, so, I, I'm, you know, ultimately, you can always start small and work up. That's, that's the point. If you've got something that, like I said, is being requested 10 times a minute, actually, caching for one minute is still worthwhile because you're still saving nine, nine requests. Um, likewise, if you've got something that it doesn't matter if it's real time, so our customers can obviously view reports and graphs on how their sales are going and whatever else. Now, we cache those for 15 minutes. Um, we did actually, funny story, have a customer once that went, well, I'm not happy, I want my graph to update in real time. And I was like, do you want to pay triple the price? And they're like, oh, 15 minutes is fine. <laughs> so that's all good. But you, know, you can play with it. Um, as I said, though, you know, actually getting to a point, if you have full control of the data, then infinite caching is possible. If you know that our data is coming from a database and the only ways to update that data are someone, say, submits a form on the control panel or a change is made via an API, you control all the times when that could be changed. So you know when it changes and then you invalidate the cache. Um, again, it's Laravel, don't shoot me. Um, but what you can do in Laravel, and I know you can do similar things, is you can tag each uh, thing that you cache. So we can say, right, this, this is doing basically generating a, a, a category tree. It's quite slow because the category tree varies for obviously every account and various rules within it. Um, and so what we do is, because it's slow, we, we cache it. And we say, right, tag it with the prefix categories and the account ID. So we now know, and we cache it, as it says there, forever. And we know that until it changes again, when it can only be changed via the control panel. We know there is no other way of updating the categories. It cannot be done. There is no other code path that allows changing. We then go, right, well, when it gets changed, then just bin those caches, the cache that's tagged with that account ID. And then a new one gets generated, and that gets stored forever until it changes again. And actually, as long as you have control, and, and this kind of ties into what was being discussed this morning about knowing your inputs and your outputs. If you know every time that could possibly change, you can quite confidently cache forever. Um, something you, again, as I mentioned, I used to work in a Magento house. Uh, I don't know how much people know about Magento, but it's horribly slow. Um, if, you, if you don't have a cache for something, then go and make a coffee or some, I don't know. It's, it's not as bad now with Magento 2, to be fair, but back in Magento 1 days, it wasn't great. So pre-warming is something that you can do. Um, Pre-warming basically means that rather than allowing the first sucker, I mean user, to be the one to generate the cache for you, you go and hit pages you know are going to be slow, and then it builds the cache and it's already there, so when that first, when that first user comes along, they get the nice cached version and it's nice and quick. Um, obviously, don't pre-warm every single page. If it's a page that very rarely gets used, there's no point, but if you've, like on a, an e-commerce store, if you've got a home page and maybe your top 10 categories, whatever, pre-warm those makes things that much quicker when someone comes to, comes to hitting it. So yeah, caching, it's all good. Very briefly going to just look at threat protection. As I mentioned, it's something that you know, happens and hap probably happens to a lot of people without realizing it. If you're just kind of seeing your normal request metrics, it could be that 10,000 10, of those a minute or whatever are actually somebody trying to knock your server offline. It, it still just comes in as your normal traffic unless you're looking for those particular patterns. But threat protection or you know, DDoSes and that sort of thing do steal resources away from your legitimate users that actually need it. So you know, that can be, it could be DDoS attacks, like I mentioned. It could also be just someone that's using your API. And you know, let's say it's an API that gets a list of products, but they're calling it every five seconds. Well, are your products changing every five seconds? No. No, they're not. So stop. Just Stop. But that happens. Or, you know, crawlers from some search engine that just keep hitting your pages or whatever else. These things are all stealing your resources from your customers or from your users. So rate limiting is perfectly legitimate. If you've got an API and you go, the, the state of this API doesn't change more than once every 10 minutes, then don't let someone career every five seconds. It doesn't make sense. You don't need to. Just go, right, okay, rate limit. And you can, you know, even if it's once a minute, it's still probably going to be lots of the same, but at least you, you're not just hitting it repeatedly. Um, you know, you can rate limit your whole API if you've got nothing, or you could do it on a per request. If you're using things like Cloudflare, uh, Cloudflare now can do a lot of that stuff for you, which is quite nice. Um, 
So yeah, as I mentioned, Cloudflare using something like a CDN. Now, a CDN means that some static resources like images and CSS, you don't have to serve from your own servers. They can come from, you know, it doesn't have to be Cloudflare, other CDNs are available. Um, but that's a good way, again, if there's stuff that is static, um, just set, hive all that stuff off and let someone else's servers deal with it. Let your servers just deal with the stuff that's important to you, your actual business logic, your actual work. So yeah, in an ideal world, okay, we would think about scaling during the original build. Uh, but the reality is it's often not the case because oftentimes we're building a proof of concept. We're building an MVP. We don't necessarily have the time or resources or staff or whatever to think about scaling. So the first thing to do when you start hitting some of these problems is understand your problem space. You know, are you talking about your DB? Are you talking about your web instances? Use, like I said, something like New Relic or Datadog. Monitor, log, met metric size, make metrics of your problem, so that you know exactly where the problem, where the bottlenecks are. And then isolate the problem parts. Buy yourself that time. This is the thing that I would say is don't go, shit, we need to do everything right now. There's, there's, there's no necessary. Just go, right, we can buy ourselves some breathing room. We can buy ourselves two weeks, a month, whatever that might be, to then go and have a proper think about the best way to solve the problem. Um, and that will make it much easier to scale the things that, that are the problem space anyway. And with that, I thank you.